Good morning. Um, first, I'd like to uh, acknowledge um, sort of our coordinating attorney on this, Victoria Holman, who's here, who helped uh, put everything together. Um, I also have to tell you, it was, a, it was strange. It was about happened while I was on my vacation a couple of weeks ago, but I got this phone call that we lost a Supreme Court case, but it was based on our arguments, so we won. Um, I'm a Browns fan, so I'm used to some losing seasons, but this was the first time I can ever recall losing and winning at the same time. It's a strange occurrence. Um, uh, the fundamentals of this case are the same as what were filed in the Ohio Supreme Court earlier. Uh, the court basically said they did not want to rule on the two remaining issues, which are the corporate powers issue and uh, the issue of having an equity stake in a private corporation. Um, the um, legal issues uh, have not changed, nor have the ethical and moral issues. Uh, when you can both combine private and public funds, it causes a lot of confusion. Um, and it uh, leads to politicizing the creation of jobs in Ohio uh, more than it already was in this political process. Uh, one other note that has come out from some of the different bills, um, in, uh, in talking to my colleagues, in House Bill 153, it does allow us in the future to raise constitutional issues within 60 days of Jobs Ohio uh, creating a constitutional conflict in the future. The only problem with that is there are no public records and we will not know um, until their annual report, what they voluntarily report, uh, I believe every January or February, um, what would have occurred. So they have once again created a statute during the process as this has evolved, um, where uh, while the citizens will have the right to sue technically, <coughs> we won't be able to see uh, behind the cloak of secrecy to be able to know whether we can sue in time. Um, that, once again, seems to be an end around of, uh, of this law. I am pleased that we, this, so far this suit has resulted in a lot of progress on a number of fronts, uh, but I wish uh, that the administration would um, stop hiding behind the cloak of secrecy and uh, what they have created here in terms of lack of transparency so that even as this case goes forward and as this uh, issue goes forward, Ohioans will have the right to know what's going on with public money and the private entity. Um, we shall see, once this case goes through the courts, whether Jobs Ohio can stand up. And if it cannot, maybe it takes care of itself through this lawsuit. That we can all take questions. Dennis, the constitutional wall that you were talking about between private funds and, and I'm sorry, public funds and private uh, corporations. Was that weakened with the uh, passage of the Third Frontier Constitutional Amendment? No, there have been discussions that have occurred over the course of the last roughly 40 years about whether some provisions uh, in that area of the Constitution shouldn't be modified. They were at one point modified to allow additional flexibility on the part of the state in terms of making loans, um, but the provision regarding equity investments has not changed. And so are you, are you taking issue with the million bucks uh, that is going to Jobs Ohio as sort of the startup costs? Or are you also taking issue with the, uh, the liquor profit lease that is yet to occur? Well, specifically, my comments were directed to the, uh, to the, the million dollars that was invested initially. Someone owns Jobs Ohio. That's the state of Ohio. But it's a private corporation at this point in time. It has a million dollars of the state's money. That's not allowed. I'm not taking issue with it. This, the Constitution itself takes issue with it. And then you are also suing to halt the, uh, the investment of, uh, of money by Jobs Ohio into private companies, which is something that hasn't happened. Uh, what we have done is file a lawsuit challenging the organization, the way Jobs Ohio is being operated, and that, that structure is unconstitutional. We are, as a whole, we are not uh, specifically um, um, 
pursuing a particular strategy uh, with the, the liquor uh, transfer uh, and so forth. Uh, we feel that it's a house of cards and once we knock down the base, which is the structure of this as being unconstitutional, all of it will fall. Uh, we will, as we, uh, my belief, uh, we, uh, prior to the dismissal based upon jurisdiction in the Ohio Supreme Court, we did file a temporary restraining order from Jobs Ohio uh, proceeding uh, in any of these activities. Um, we are uh, looking and uh, um, um, Victoria, the, the attorney uh, who is helping us uh, so much on this, is, is helping to put together uh, a similar motion that uh, we hope to be pursuing uh, uh, before the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas. If I could add to that, uh, Senator Skindle makes uh, an excellent point on what the, lit what the litigation is designed to do. The question about the sale or the long-term lease of, the, of, those, of that income stream from the Division of Liquor Control, that's a policy question. I disagree, but that's a policy question that a majority can make. And the question of how uh, those dollars then get used is a constitutional question where the courts have an obligation to weigh in, and that's what the that's what the litigation is ultimately directed at. So, are you arguing that the that the lease of the liquor profits, the, the money generated by that lease, would continue to be public dollars? Because the uh, Department of Commerce argues that those, as soon as the lease were to transpire, that that money would no longer be public; that it would become private. Uh, well, you could you could call it lots of different things. It's still public money. Uh, that's a revenue stream that's being derived from a government function. Uh, so that is those are public dollars. So I, I would take issue with how those dollars would be used if they were to take any number of equity positions. I mean, you know, the the, the Constitution bars uh, ownership in a private corporation, and that doesn't matter whether it's stock, warrants, uh, convertible debentures, or anything like that. And so. Uh, all those things would be barred, and uh, that's, that's where we take exception. Let me uh, draw a distinction also on the corporate structure here. There would essentially, I may disagree with the policy on this, but essentially there would be nothing wrong in doing at the state level what uh, communities, uh, cities, and uh, counties have done in the past, which is to contract uh, their economic development, some of their economic development functions with nonprofit corporations that are set, set up separately. It happens all the time. So in the Cleveland area, uh, you have all these development corps. Uh, they are nonprofit corporations organized on their own. It's not organized by the county or the city or anything. But the, the city uh, works with those organizations and contracts with them to do certain functions. Uh, the state could do the same thing, contract with a um, economic development corporation that's established for that. So the Chamber of Commerce could go out and establish something like that on their own, not to have the state. The, the problem here is that the state is establishing this corporation, is owning this corporation, and then is allowing this corporation to invest in other uh, entities. And they intend to do that because in the legislation in House Bill 153 as well as House Bill 1, they talk about the subsidiaries of Jobs Ohio. And that, that's an intent that this corporation is going to be setting up other corporations and uh, even taking equity interest in other corporations. That's the difference, is something that is set up on its own as a non-for-profit corporation under Ohio's general laws versus something set up by the state as a corporation, the state owning that, and, and that entity taking uh, investment uh, interest in other corporations. Senator, what's the end game here? Do you want the court to look at this quickly? I mean, just today, Jobs Ohio is in the northeast part of the state. Uh, it, it's making deals. It's getting things rolling. Uh, so they're proceeding regardless of what you're doing. What is the end game here, and how quickly do you want a resolution? Well, uh, again, we feel that uh, uh, one of the reasons we're exploring the temporary restraining order um, to be filed in the court shortly, I believe, is uh, to slow down some of this so that the court can actually take a look at the constitutional issues um, and uh, make a decision on the merits of the case. Uh, that, that is most important. So uh, the, the end game is to 
if you're going to do economic development, do it within the bounds of the Ohio Constitution. And if you're successful in uh, getting this injunction, what would be the effect on economic development functions currently in the state? Would the Department of Development just continue to do what it's been doing? Under the current system, the Department of Development could continue doing what it's doing. However, it's nothing preventing the majority from then passing legislation allowing economic development, the Department of Economic Development, to contract with another entity that is formed constitutionally. Uh, and again, I may vote against that because I disagree with the policy. That's policy. That's, that's not uh, a legal violation of the Constitution. Until you file a temporary restraining order, Jobs Ohio, even though you don't think that they have the authority to do it, could start making some of these investments that you spoke of. Isn't that, is that correct? Yes. Uh, Dennis, I think you've talked about this before, but what would be the wisdom of uh, a private company out there doing business with Jobs Ohio with this uh, hanging over Jobs Ohio's head? Well, I'm going to leave that judgment to the individual business, but I mean, that's part of the argument we've been making to the administration and to the majority for the last seven months. Do this with a solid, firm constitutional footing so you can go forward with the policy that you want to implement. By ignoring these constitutional concerns or brushing them aside and, and proceeding headlong with the, with the legislation, I think they do run the risk of, of uh, some of these deals either being upended or in the short term causing some hesitancy to, to enter into these arrangements. So if Jobs Ohio is counting on its main funding stream being the lease of the liquor fund, and you are, I thought I heard you say you are not arguing that that is unconstitutional. Is this really, is this just a, a fight over the million dollars in startup costs? And it is not, again, about the million dollars or the um, uh, decision to, to transfer the liquor profits over to this company. Again, it's the structure of Jobs Ohio creating a corporation uh, under specific act uh, conferring corporate powers and uh, allowing this corporation, the state, to take an uh, equity interest in this corporation. And the issue of us turning the million dollars is evidence of us taking an equity interest in Jobs Ohio uh, and then allowing that corporation, that state created corporation, to take equity interest in other uh, entities, exposing taxpayers. Uh, and the resources provided to taxpayers uh, in, financial, in financial risk. I can add to that that the difference is what you do with the money. Uh, if, you, if you've got a constitutional structure, and one of the points, points that Senator Skindle is making is you don't right now. But if you have a constitutional structure, and what, whatever means you choose, maybe the contract with a private corporation, and you then choose to enter into a long-term lease uh, for the profits from the Division of Liquor Control, we would disagree with that policy, but the government could do that, the state could do that. If it then wanted to use those dollars for constitutional purposes, constitutionally permitted purposes, such as, let's say, grants or loans, those are likely permissible. But you want to take an equity position, that's where, you, that's where it draws the line, or goes over the line. How long, and I, I know this is probably guesswork at this point, but through experience, how long do you think it would take for this case to work its way back up to the Ohio Supreme Court for this issue to be once and for all decided? Actually, although Dennis and I are experienced in this area, I'd also like to just call up uh, Victoria Oman for him. Victoria, you want to come up to the microphone and uh, um, try to uh, answer that question? It depends on how the state responds and how much time each person needs to do everything. It's set already on a track in common police court to go to trial sometime next year. Uh, depending on whether or not that goes forward, as the court's already said it, probably by the end of next year, it takes about a year for stuff to get through the 10th district, and then we will go to the um, Supreme Court. So but, minimum two years? Uh, I would say. And, uh, but, once we determine whether or not we're going to do the preliminary injunction, a lot of the issues may well be decided in that, in that motion hearing. Um, the, um, 
lost my train of thought. A lot of the issues we need to present will be presented then. And unlike the Supreme Court, we filed the temporary restraining order in the Supreme Court, but there's all sorts of odd reasons why they won't hear that, and generally they won't do a, a hearing. Once, the reason we're not sure exactly when that's going to be filed is once a motion for a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction is filed in common pleas, they must give us a hearing. So we have to time it so everybody can be available and that sort of stuff. So that may happen quite soon. And what do you think? What do you think you would file the temporary restraining order? Um, I have to coordinate it with my fellows here, but I hope in the next couple of weeks. And is the a temporary restraining order a final appealable order itself that can be appealed on? Generally not. It's preliminary. Uh, the permanent injunction becomes a final appealable order. But, but as an example, the, on the private privatization, the privatization of prisons students that we have today, that uh, they had hearings all day yesterday, even though we filed it Friday. They have uh, until the end of the day today to turn in briefs, and the court will actually make a decision on prison privatization by uh, 3 o'clock tomorrow. But that has to do with the timing of the sale. Just so that I understand, so Jobs and I was out and about doing their thing. What is the short term time scale for the injunction, and does that injunction hold then until the final resolution? Yes, it would hold until final final resolution, and I gather, I, whenever I filed it yesterday, I took it, a copy of the, um, of the complaint to the judge's office, they have it, and they know that we are contemplating filing this to try to make it smooth, as smoothly as possible, but this is the first time that we've gotten together since then to be able to talk about time frames is going to be after this.